Good morning, y'all. If you have a Bible, would you open it up with me to Revelation chapter 21 this morning? Revelation 21, it's in the very back of your Bible, um, and it uh, should be pretty easy to find. Um, I had to come in from the other side this morning because Amos had told me if he caught me on the way out of the baptism that he would uh, give me a hug and get me wet. So that's what your pastor does is he hides from little kids when they're getting baptized in the back. Uh, it's exciting to be finishing up this series with you this morning. We've been, uh, for the past three weeks, walking through a series that we titled Foundations, uh, where we're looking back upon some of these historic truths that have anchored the church uh, throughout the generations, especially in light of um, uh, cultural shifts, in light of uh, uh, social chaos, times whenever basic understandings of, of what humanity is and who God is uh, come into question once again. We go back to some of these foundational questions and uh, investigate again what the scripture teaches us about who we are, who God is, and uh, how we have any semblance of hope in such a, a chaotic and frenetic world. And so the first week we talked about uh, answering the most basic question of all from the scriptures, who is God? And if we don't start there, we lose our bearings. If we don't keep in some sort of, uh, some, some sort of construct, the creator and creation distinction, all things begin to kind of fall apart. And then as we looked in the scriptures, we saw once we identify God as creator, we are creation, then we're free to ask the question, well, what is a person? How did God stamp humanity? How did he make people? What, what was at the very beginning intrinsic and what it means to be human? And as we discovered, it means that we're made in the image of God. And then last week, we asked the question, okay, well, in light of that, if there is a God and we are human beings, then uh, how do we hold on to any sense of hope, especially as it often seems that the world kind of is coming unraveled around us or our plans, our hopes, and our desires may have fallen apart? How do we hold on and maintain some eye towards this fulfilled vision of hope. And we looked and saw in Galatians chapter 2 that we've been crucified with Christ. If you are in Christ, if you have faith in Jesus, you've been crucified with him, and now you live into him and into his fullness and into his character and his image and his likeness. And today, maybe perhaps the most important question of all in all of this is that if all of that is true, then where are we going? Not just we as individuals, but we as the church, and not just the church, but, but human history. Is it building to something? Is it leaning into something? And what does the scripture have to say about the trajectory of, of, our, of our species and of people? And what is God doing in the midst of all things if he's got an end in mind with where this is all going to wind up? And so that's where we find ourselves this morning in Revelation 21 uh, in verses 1 through 8. Uh, the Apostle John, who gets this vision from Jesus on the island of Patmos as he's been exiled due to his faith and his preaching of the good news of the gospel, Jesus pulls back the curtain of human history and begins to reveal things to him. And here it all kind of comes to a conclusion in these first eight verses. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe, wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, and these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have his heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is the word of the Lord. Early on in believing and trusting that the Lord had called me into ministry, the guy that was discipling me and mentoring me in the faith said, hey, if anyone ever gives you an opportunity to preach, if this is what you think the Lord's calling you into, if you ever have an opportunity to go and share the gospel, then just say yes and do it. That's how you kind of 
earn your street cred. That's how you exercise those muscles. That's how you learn how to do what it is that we pastors do. And so I said, okay. And uh, about 21, 22 years ago, right before I got married, I got a call from a, a camp, a Christian camp in Colorado that had asked me to come and, and lead a retreat, a weekend retreat. And it was uh, kind of in the, the early spring, late winter months. And so I was a little bit you know, scared of that because I know they get a lot of snow, but I said yes to it. And they, they had invited my friend to come and, and lead the music for the, for the retreat. And so I was kind of excited. And I was just supposed to preach three times on Saturday. And that was, that was the whole gig. I was living in Oklahoma City at the time and working a job, just a regular job at, at an electronics company. And so uh, I couldn't take off work early because I was new to the job and didn't have much paid time off. And so I had to leave like Friday at noon and the camp was supposed to start Saturday morning. The retreat was Saturday morning. And it was about a 12 hour drive from where I was. And so I knew it was going to be kind of a tight window. And my buddy comes and picks me up. Uh, He had to drive from Arkansas to Oklahoma City to get me on the way. And when he showed up, he's like, hey, man, I didn't tell you this, but um, I'm trying to pass a kidney stone. And uh, I have this thing that the doctor's done to my, my body that requires me to stop and go to the bathroom about every 30 to 45 minutes at the most. Um, and I may, you know, like pass out. It, it's really, I've done this before. This is really bad. But, but I didn't want to tell you that because I was afraid you would cancel and I really want to do this. And so I was like, Okay, so he set off on this 12-hour drive, making it at most like an hour, and he can't drive. He's taking some pain meds, so he's just basically passed out in the passenger seat. I got to drive the whole way. We hit the Continental Divide at like 11 p.m. in the middle of a snowstorm, and I've never driven. I'm from, you know, backwoods, Oklahoma. I've never driven in snow like that. It's just just a complete white sheet in front of the car, so I'm going like three miles an hour. I can barely see the lines. My buddy's Pass out. I'm like, why did we decide to do this? Like, when it says suffering for the kingdom of God, I think that this this is what this means. And so we roll into our host house at like one or two in the morning, utterly exhausted, and uh, get a couple hours of sleep. I was not prepared for altitude, so I didn't know that when you sleep at a really high altitude, even though you breathe regular like you do at low altitude, you don't get enough oxygen. And so I was waking up like thinking I was going to die. <gasps> why can I not breathe? You know. Terrible night's sleep, get up. I preach three times on Saturday. My buddy does this music. We finish up, and I'm like, finally, I'm going to go back. I'm going to sleep a little bit, and um, we'll get up tomorrow and leave. But the host of the retreat comes to me and says, hey, man, uh, we got a really big storm coming in, like a big snowstorm. I'm afraid if you don't get on the road like right now, you're probably going to be stuck here for a while. And I'm like, man, I just got out of the car, <laughs> and I preached three times, and I can't breathe. And this guy's worthless over here with the kidney stone thing. (laughs) And so we load up and we start driving back. And I don't know if you've ever made that trek before. There's no good way to go to Colorado from here in case you're wondering. Kansas is bad. Texas is worse. Like, pick your poison. And we make it about three quarters of the way back from uh, Amarillo, Texas. And my buddy's like, I got to go to the bathroom again. And it's three or four in the morning. And I pull off at one of those roadside stops where it looks like the beginning scenes of every horror film ever. <laughs> like, this is where the murder always happens. And I'm like, man, I, I, don't know if I, can, I, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I don't know if I can make it the rest of the way home. He can't. I'm just going to park here. And if they want to kill me, someone can kill me. Otherwise, I'll get a little bit of sleep and we'll make it home. And I got to thinking about that and I was, as, as I was considering one of, the, one of the worst road trips of my life, if not the worst. One of the things that makes the, the trip so bad so often, if you've ever been on a bad road trip, is not knowing where this is going to end. Right? If you've ever been unsure of the destination, if you're going to a, a new part of the country or a, a place you've never visited, you don't really know how close you're getting. And again, I know I have to go back in time and say this is the, the days before the GPS, right? This is when MapQuest gave us all of our directions there and we'd printed them off before we left. But, but if you don't know where you're going, it can make the trip that much harder, that much more painful. Every stop along the way seems like it's delaying the process. If you don't know where you're going, the trip can be really, really hard. And we asked the question this morning, where are we going? And I said at the beginning, when I say we, I'm not just talking about individuals and I'm not just talking about the church. I'm talking here about human history, 
Where is all of this headed? And what I love about the scriptures is that the scriptures give us, I think, in some sense, a, a conception, an, an, an idea. John paints a, a vivid picture here with, filled with, with imagery and with metaphor and, and, and with uh, insight as to where human history is going simply for this reason. Because God does not want us to be abandoned to the idea that, that we don't know where we're going so that the journey is that much more painful and that much more hard. Instead, John pulls back the curtain and shows us the resolution of human history. It's, it's crescendo. It's, it's coming to fulfillment that, that God had intended from the very beginning so that as we limp along in this journey with its ups and its downs, its highs and its lows, its pains and sorrows, and its joys and victories, we can have some measured assurance that God is doing something, that he's taking us somewhere that all of this is, is just not for naught. It's, it's, it's building in us and completing something that God has intended from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and in the end, a new heaven and a new earth descends. So I want to answer that question, really, I think, with three things this morning. Where are we going? John gives us here through, through imagery and through metaphor through symbols and signs, I think three things that we can cling to in a tumultuous time when we're unsure about where anything may be going in our lives, three things that we can cling to that we can have some assurance that, that God is up to something, that he hasn't abandoned nor forsaken us, and that God is leading this somewhere. The first thing that we see this morning when we say, where are we going? We're going towards, at least in John's vision here, a restored creation, a restored creation. Now, it's really important to kind of qualify this because so, for so much of my life, and at least in uh, the world that I was reared in and in also being in the church now for some 25, 30 years, sometimes this point gets lost. And when this point gets lost, lots of things begin to fall apart. Uh, there was a, a picture or an imagery, perhaps, of heaven that you may have received through, uh, through Sunday school, through you know, revivals, maybe if you went around church you know, 20, 30 years ago, and that was a thing, that essentially tells you that heaven is this disembodied place that we're going, and right now we're just passing through. But if you look at the vision that John gives here of what heaven and earth looks like and the, the completion and the, 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 the maturity of all things, the goal of all things, it's a new heaven and a new earth. And heaven, John says, is coming here. It's not that we're going there. It's that it's coming down to us. Look back at verses 1 and 2. John says, then I saw in this, this vision and this revelation that Jesus is giving him, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, this is why when you interpret Revelation, you got to be really careful with the symbolism and, and, and with, uh, with, with the way that John tells. This is apocalyptic literature, because if, if you take it too literally and you say the sea is no more, then I hate to break it to you guys. If you're a literalist on Revelation, that means there's no beach in heaven, and I just don't believe that, <laughs> Right? That's not what John, the sea and John's metaphors and imagery is all the chaos. It's the place where disorder comes from. It's the place where frustration is spawned. It's the thing that the devil comes out of, right? And so when he says the sea is no more, he's talking about the stuff that leads to pain and, and crying and tears and mourning and all the stuff that John says that will be no more either. But a new heaven and a new earth. Heaven is coming here. It is God's intentions to renew the current creation. To, to make all things new, as this voice from the throne says. You don't see individual souls escaping earth. Instead, you see heaven coming down and transforming or healing the earth, making it new. You may have heard this before, but the Greek word for new there is like new in kind. This is, this is a metamorphosis of the creation. This is the creation as God had intended it to be. And because heaven is coming down, I believe then that has implications for us. I believe for the church, the people for whom this letter was written, specifically seven churches in Asia Minor, John gets this revelation and he sends this letter out to seven different churches, all at different places in their maturity and in their faith, all dealing with different challenges, all dealing with different heresies, all of them needing to be fastened to these foundations once again. And in each one of those churches, this implication comes with this. If, if heaven is coming down to earth, then we have a responsibility to be an acting renewal now, to be living into the fullness of what it means for God's new creation to come down, that we can be a people who, who are so heavenly-minded we are of earthly good. 
I mentioned just a second ago the, the kind of the legacy of revivalism in our country. That was, you, you make a decision to ask Jesus into your heart, and then you basically just bide your time until you die and go to heaven. That, that vision is relatively new in church history. In fact, I would say it's sort of anathema in church history, because if you go back to the early stages of the early church, the idea that heaven was coming to earth is what motivated the church to be the church in the world. Historian Rodney Stark wrote a fantastic book some 20, 30 years ago called The Rise of Early Christianity. And as a historian, he tells the story about how Christianity went from like this um, minor movement amongst the, the marginalized in the first century to overtaking the Roman Empire in 300 years. And Stark says basically one thing happened that caused this, this big shift in, in, in the world and especially in the Roman Empire as it pertained to Christianity, that the plagues hit Rome. And when the plagues hit Rome, some 35,000 people were dying a week, and everyone was leaving Rome as fast as they could get out, except for one group, the Christians. And the Christians stayed amongst the dying and amongst the hurting and amongst the suffering and cared for them and loved them and, and in some case nursed them back to health such that when people came back into the city when the plague was gone, they, they saw that this had become a Christianized place. Not in the sense that they had grabbed certain power structures so that they could impose their will on everyone, but because they had loved so well that this movement had taken a foot in, in the Roman Empire and it changed the course of human history. Why? Because they were so heavenly minded, they became unbelievably good for the earth. Because they were so convinced that the plague wouldn't wipe them out. Jesus had rose from the dead. They didn't have to fear the plague. They didn't have to fear whatever sickness or barbarian conqueror was at the gates. They didn't have to fear anything. They could simply enact the love and grace and mercy of Jesus to their neighbor because in the end, Jesus wins. And so they became so heavenly minded, they became unbelievably good for the earth, unbelievably good for the planet, unbelievably good for their neighbor. That's what it means to believe that heaven is coming here. Secondly, they believed that Jesus had won the victory. That's what John shows us here. Jesus wins. Verse 6, the very first part of verse 6, the voice from the throne says, it is done or it is finished. Familiar cadence of Jesus from the cross itself. It is done. I am the alpha and the omega. There's nothing that has happened that he did not initiate, and there's nothing that will happen that he will not bring to its conclusion. Jesus is the Lord over all things. He set into motion these events. And so we as believers now can be so assured of Jesus' victory that there's no challenge that stands in front of us that we cannot press into without some semblance of faith and hope for ultimate deliverance. If he can say it is finished, if he can assure us of the victory in the end, then we now in this moment can stare down any challenge that we currently face, any hard situation. We can name it. We can look it in the eye and we can say that this thing will not ultimately take me out because if this is true and it is, and Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega and he's the beginning and the end, then that conjures up in me at least enough faith to say I can face whatever's in front of me. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. That's the hope of a restored creation. That's the hope of a new heaven and a new earth coming down for God's people. But in that hope, not just is it that that there's these cataclysmic events, that heaven comes down and Jesus wins the victory, there's also hope for all of us, even as individuals. We don't just get a restored creation. We get a renewed person, a completely renewed being. Look back at verse 3. And John says, I heard a loud voice from heaven, from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain for the former things have passed away. So this was the goal. This was the goal of creation. This was the the heartbeat of God's initiating action in history to start this whole thing, to dwell with his beings made in his image. 
The hope of Genesis 1, Adam and Eve are in the garden with God. They are naked and they are not ashamed. God walks with them in the cool of the day, but sin comes in and fractures this whole thing. And it's why we need foundations, because as sin runs roughshod over creation, Adam and Eve begin to question their very identity, their very person. Their sons turn on one another. Uh, hatred and murder enters the cosmos. We get to the Tower of Babel collapsing. Like everything begins to start to fall apart. But John says... Sin doesn't have the last word. These human beings that caused this event will be redeemed and fully made uh, aware of the truth that they are in God's presence and they are fully accepted. They are with God and God is with them. It's the hope of the gospel that we talked about last week. It's, it, we're with God. There's no more separation. There's full inclusion. And we have a realized adoption. We've been made one with our maker. One of my favorite books that kind of gives image, shape to this image of what it means to be in the presence of God and to be fully aware of our adoption was, uh, it's actually a book about adoption. A guy named Russell Moore wrote a book several years ago called Adopted for Life. And he tells this story about he and his wife going to Russia to adopt these two particular uh, orphan boys that became their sons. And he said, even though they had, they had, they had adopted them, the, the, the state and the country had stamped this adoption. They had his last name. They had transitioned all the way back from a Russian orphanage back to the, to the U.S. It took years, he would say, and maybe even still to this day, a long time for them to live into the fullness of that adoption, to really realize that they don't have to be scared anymore, that they're not abandoned, that they're not alone. And so there's this increasing awareness of this thing that is true, is, is, is not just true in the future, it's true right now. And so John gives the church, I think, this image. We will be with God. He will be our Lord. We will be his people in his presence so that we can realize some, some measure of, of the satisfaction, the fulfillment, the grace, the mercy, the love that we have in the here and now because this is where God's taking us. All tears, all suffering, all death, all gone. And a renewed person will have this relationship with their maker. They are fully and finally established in his presence the way that he intended from the very beginning. And that, that truth, that, that hope, a renewed person, that's where we're going. And so we lean into that now. What does that mean? Well, one of the things that, that, that John shows us here is that these people who meet their maker, who stand in his presence, they have their desires fulfilled. Completely and totally satisfied desires. Look back at verse 6. He said to me, it is done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of, of the water of life without payment. To the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. To the thirsty. To those who in this earthly existence recognize you have aches and you have yearnings, and you have longings, and no matter how long you live, how hard you look, you don't seem to find whatever it is that can fill that up. And the reason that John is revealing this to us, I believe, is the same reason why C.S. Lewis once wrote, look, if you find in yourself a longing that cannot be fulfilled with anything in this world, then you have but one conclusion to draw. You were made for another world. If you find within yourself a yearning, a longing, a passion, a desire, an itch that cannot be scratched with anything that you stumble upon on this planet, then you only have one conclusion to make. You were made for a different world. That God has wrought into our bones, into our being, these desires to be with him, to be fulfilled in him, to be completely and totally fully renewed by him. And if you're a believer in Jesus this morning, that's where you're going. The Apostle Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 8 when he tells the church in Rome, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is nothing that can condemn you, if you through faith in Jesus. No condemnation. At the end of that chapter, he says, there's nothing in all of creation that can separate you from the love of God that is yours in Christ Jesus. So there's no condemnation and there's no separation. And in between those two truths, Paul sandwiches this one paragraph where he says, so if, if we can't be condemned, if we can't be separated, then what does that mean for where history is going? It means that we are more than conquerors. It means that whatever we're facing in the here and now, we can face it with some measure of courage and bravery and hope because we can't be condemned by God and we won't be separated from God. This is what he writes. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the cre- creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Paul says the whole creation is echoing and reverberating with this longing to find its crescendo and its fulfillment in God. That's why we have these desires. That's why we have these, these yearnings and these longings within us, because they're, they're pointing to something that this world cannot find or satisfy us with, which means if you're becoming a renewed person, you are not defined by your desires. Your identity and what you long for are not the same thing. And that, that goes with with your financial aspirations, with your career aspirations, with your whatever your sexual longings may be, your relational longings may be, those things do not define you. Those things are meant to point to something beyond you. You need not grind yourself into dust in hopes of acceptance from other people. The acceptance you long for is found in the adoption as a son or daughter of the Most High God. In Jesus, you are more than your desires. In Jesus, you are fully accepted by God. That's why we need to know where we're going so that in the chaos of our current moment with all these random truths bearing down on us and beating us up, we need to be anchored in these things. No, I'm not what I long for. My longings point to something, a a hope, a, a, a sense of being, a sense of worth that one day will be recognized fully and faithfully in Jesus Christ, my Lord. So that's our last point. Where are we going? We're going to a redeemed relationship a redeemed relationship with God and even with one another. John's saying here, whatever's going on in our world, this is, this is, again, a letter written to seven very specific churches in Asia Minor, seven churches that are facing heresy. They're, they're facing the threat of paganism. They're, they're facing the threat of, of, of no longer existing because if they stand for the gospel, they'll get snuffed out and killed. They're facing the threat of all of these kind of sideways truths, be they some sort of rampant fundamentalism or sexual deviance, has crept into the church. All of those threats are bearing down on them. But John says, rather than see those things as something that we cave into, instead we see those things as what God is using to prepare us for this moment. There's a Greek word that's used more than any other word all throughout this letter. It's a Greek word, hupomone or hupomone, and it means endurance to the one who endures to the end. John is writing this letter so that the people of God will see that all of the, the hard stuff in your life is a, is a rehearsal for, for heaven itself. All of the challenges that you face, all of the difficulties, all of the circumstances that feel like they're going to take you under, all of that is causing you to lean into, be prepared for a redeemed relationship. All of our present suffering is preparing us, as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians, for an eternal weight of glory. And, Paul, and John here says that because of that, then, that this comes with a promise and it comes with a warning. If, if, if life itself is a preparation, if life itself is a rehearsal for this, this moment that we endure till the end to a faithful Savior who is faithful to us and endured for us and in us, then we need to see the promise that's associated with that and the warning that comes if we, if we neglect that or deny that. The promise is simply this. Suffering is over for those who trust Jesus by faith. If we endure till the end, if we hang in there, if we don't allow these things that are pressing in on us to shape our souls, but instead allow them to cause our souls to be submitted to to the one true God, then in that we can know that one day there will be no more pain, no more crying, no more mourning. The former things will pass away. But if instead we see these threats and we see these contrary truths and we see these lies that press in on us and we begin to believe those things, not only believe those things, but promote those things, if we're taken under by the chaos of our day, then this last verse at the end of this section, but as for the cowardly, verse 8, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. If in an attempt 
to get all that the world has to offer. And if in an attempt to try to deny this one basic truth that all human beings experience, that to live is to suffer, if we try to suppress that truth in unrighteousness, then John says, at the crescendo, at the conclusion of all things, comes judgment. And so he sends this letter out to the churches, one to say, yes, endure. Don't be taken under. Don't let these false falsehoods and these half-truths that swirl around that are trying to capture your heart and your soul and your motivation, don't let those things take you down. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He, he'll come for you. But, but if you don't, you need to recognize, like, God is just. He's a just judge. He did not give his son away so that he could be spurned and neglected. Instead, we stand and we give an account. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the life we lived in the flesh. And so the hope here that John, I think, has is that we will see this warning, and instead of, you know, thumbing our nose at it, we'll instead say, okay, Lord, refine me. Lord, bring me to repentance. Lord, show me what is in me that needs to be tweaked or, or, or maneuvered by your spirit for the sake of your kingdom so that I endure till the end. Because again, y'all, a redeemed relationship means ultimately where this is going, we will be with God. There will be a fully restored creation. We will be a fully renewed person. And this morning, if you're in Christ, that should cause your soul to leap within you. That, that whatever you've done is not the, the record that you'll be judged by. You'll be judged in, in, in the end by the record of Jesus, which is perfect righteousness. And the longer I serve the church, just to be honest, the more central this truth becomes for me. That the people of God are called to long for God, to anticipate this, this thing, to yearn for your faith to be made sight and to allow these present struggles, these present trials, to prime our hearts for glory. That's what we were made for. Now, I don't know where you fall on this this morning. I know all of us, to various degrees, limped, here, limped in here with some measure of baggage. And I know that we all probably did so with our ears filled and our eyes filled with alternative ideas for how this whole thing can work out. But this is the hope that we rely on as Christians. Jesus loved us. He gave himself for us. He died for us so that we could be brought back to God. And he's coming back for his church. And that's where we're going. Lord, this morning, as the hymn says, tune our hearts to, to receive your grace. Let us see that there are streams of mercy in Jesus that are never ceasing. And Lord, would that lead to, to the praise of your people. God, knowing all that is just at work, even in our own community, even in our own church, I know that there is much suffering there is much hardship. There is, there is so many things that when we hear the, the call to endurance, we feel like we'll be taken under. So, Lord, by your spirit, would you put hope into your people? Would you help us to capture this vision that you have for us of where you're taking all things so that our faith would increase, so that the love and the affection that you have for us in Jesus would be felt and would be experienced, and, God, that we would be renewed in faith. Would this be to the end that, that your name is glorified? Would this be to the end that we are people who reflect you into the world? Let's show forth this hope by the love and the grace that, that you gave us, we give to our neighbor. We ask these things in the name and the power and the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.